Hello, I'm Dr. James Thomas. Welcome to VoiceDoctor.net and Laryngology 101. Today, I'm going to cover a case study of hemorrhagic vocal cord polyps. That is, bumps on the vocal cord that have blood in them. First, in case you've never seen a vocal cord, we're looking down from above, fronts here, backs here, this is the right vocal cord, and you can see that the edge of the vocal cord is smooth. Now, smoothness is important so that when the vocal cords vibrate, ee, they make a clear sound. Anytime there's a bump on the vocal cord, it's going to disrupt the sound. Hemorrhagic vocal cord polyps are a result of vocal overuse. And in the general category of vocal overuse, there are the chronic vocal overdoers, you know them, the people that can never stop talking. And then there's sudden acute vocal overuse, <coughs> coughing, screaming at a football game, yelling at a concert, talking at a bar. When you acutely overuse your voice, you can break a blood vessel. When you chronically overuse the voice, you get thickening of the skin, you get a callus. Let's take a look at vocal calluses or nodules. This person overuses their voice, halfway between the front and the back of the vocal cord is a little bump. That's a callus or a nodule of the vocal cord. They can be rather small, and even a small one, the bump stands out when you bring the vocal cords together and air leaks out from in front of and in back of the nodule. And here's another person who talks way too much and has very, very large vocal calluses, and when they come together, they have big air leak. Now, a couple of the characteristics will be similar between nodules polyps and hemorrhagic polyps, and that is whenever there's a bump, we're going to hear <sighs> air leak that we don't want. We may end up with two vocal cords that vibrate asynchronously, and we get a double pitch called diplophonia, or we may get a double pitch from the front and the back of the vocal cords vibrating separately. Let me introduce you to Linda Smith. That's not her real name, but she's a young college female that goes to football games, says that she loses her voice for two to three days after each football game from yelling or screaming. And it's never really bothered her until the beginning of this year when she screamed at a football game and lost her voice for two weeks. Since that time, her voice has never returned to normal. We're going to hear some roughness in her voice. And that's called diplophonia or double pitch. Anytime the two vocal cords are not symmetric, and in this case, since we're suspecting she might have a bump on them, we're going to hear a roughness to her voice. So let's listen to her reading. But on water, a log of wood or any large object that would float became a man's boat. Now I'm going to play her saying as steady as she can a smooth E. And again, we're going to hear this E, this double pitch quality. When I make her go up in pitch, that stretches her vocal cords out. If you have a bump on the vocal cord, as you stretch the vocal cords, you pull them closer together and it makes that bump touch. So we're gonna hear a double pitch or a real high pitch squeak because of short segment phonation. I do all that before I actually look because then I know what I'm going to find when I look. So now I put the camera in with the endoscope I slide in closer to her vocal cords. One thing I want to orient you to is that everything that matters is on the vocal cord, and many singers look at this bump and say, well, I've got a big bump here. That's an arytenoid, that's normal. We want to focus on the only thing that matters, that's the vocal cord itself. So she has two big bumps. She told us she's kind of a chronic talker, so she does have sort of nodules or polyps from chronic overuse. But more importantly for our case today, she has these large dilated blood vessels. And here I have turned on a color filter that shows the red more prominently. And these large vessels that come in from the side are ones that tell me chronic vocal overuse, the blood vessels have been broken before and when they healed, they healed larger. I can see this redness surrounding this. That is just small blood vessels going into this hemorrhagic polyp. So now we'll listen to her at low pitch, and when we do, we will hear the roughness because these bumps are not the same mass, so both vocal cords vibrate differently. And we hear that as two pitches diplophonia. As I make her go up in pitch, now we can watch, and we hear the short segment phonation 
from the vibrations of half the vocal cord. Here's a close-up view with a rigid high-definition scope. Here are the blood vessels again heading into the polyp. So Linda is just an example of hemorrhagic polyps. Let me show you some other people. One of the characteristics of hemorrhagic polyps compared to nodules is that they're red. A second is they have feeding blood vessels. And a third is they're usually asymmetric because you usually break one on one side or the other. And so those are three key differences between nodules. Here we've turned on that color filter. We can see these very prominent blood vessels. This is called a capillary lake. That's a very thin dilated blood vessel. And there's the hemorrhagic polyp. Here's some tiny blood vessels that give a red hue to it, a capillary lake. Here the polyp has actual blood in it. This gentleman, you can see that it was an acute bleed because we have this, like a bruise, hemoglobin from a week ago had bled and it's being reabsorbed by the body. It turns yellow. And in fact, when I did surgery on him, this uh, polyp was filled with a blood clot. A smaller hemorrhagic polyp, but again with a feeding vessel, a very large hemorrhagic polyp, prominent feeding vessels from both sides, multiple polyps. This person has overused their voice acutely a number of times. Again, multiple hemorrhagic polyps, a single one with a reactive thickening on the other side. If you go on speaking with a bump, when the vocal cords come together, it will trigger a reaction or a thickening on the other vocal cord. A very, very tiny hemorrhagic polyp. Many times they're there, you just have to look closely to find them. A lady who had radiation therapy, squamous cell carcinoma 20 years ago. After radiation therapy, you get these things called capillary telangiectasias. They're normal after radiation therapy. But if they're on the edge of the vocal cord, when you talk, they can fill with blood, and it gave her a rough voice more hemorrhagic polyps, capillary lakes. They come in all shapes and sizes. So now, in my mind, the treatment for a hemorrhagic polyp, we can think about medicine. I don't know of any pill that's gonna make a blood vessel reabsorb. We can think about speech therapy. I don't know of any vocal exercise that's gonna make a blood vessel reabsorb. And we can think about surgery. And because I can't find a way for the other two modalities to work, I generally suggest surgery for removing a hemorrhagic polyp, at least as the first approach. Now, they're benign. You don't have to remove them. If you don't mind a rough voice, you can keep the polyp. Let's take a look at Linda's surgery. Here I am looking down her throat. Now, the image is upside down because as a surgeon, I sit behind her head looking down her throat while she's lying on her back. So the front of the vocal cords is now here. We can see these two large swellings. And in fact, we're going to see blood vessels within them. Now the swellings do have a white surface appearance. That's the callus part of it from her chronic overuse. And as I put the endoscope in, we can see all these tiny blood vessels within them. They are hemorrhagic polyps. The blood fills the polyp. Here's my laser off to the side. I'm going ahead and injecting some adrenaline in there to push the polyp out. The whole principle behind good vocal cord surgery is that here's the vocal cord which is a muscle there's a lubricating layer and then the skin and we can remove the skin and as long as we don't get into muscle don't cut through the lubricating layer the skin will regrow back across and we'll have flexible vocal cords so to try to optimize her surgery i am pushing this out with the injection and then i will go ahead and grab the polyp and i will pull it as far across as I can away from the muscle. That gives me the most room to cut in there. This is a programmable laser called a DECA laser, and it cuts 0.42 millimeters deep with every cut. So I can cut through this polyp very precisely. It seals the blood vessels as I cut. It's a very nice way to take off polyps. And then I will go back and any dilated blood vessels, I'll put the laser on spot, and I'll try to spot weld the vessel closed so that it's not still feeding the edge of the vocal cord. I end up taking off the other side the same way. Again, grab the polyp, pull it as far away from the vocal cord as possible, set the laser on cut, and cut precisely through the edge of the polyp, leaving the muscle and the lubricating layer intact on both sides. We can see I haven't disturbed most of the blood vessels that are normal. Here she is two weeks later. She hasn't spoken at all for two weeks. 
And now we're going to hear her for the first time, and we can see the vocal cords vibrating. They're actually fairly flexible. There's still a little tiny dog ear from where the edge of the cut was. That'll heal and smooth out. Let's look at her one month later. And now the vocal cords are fairly flexible, and she's got a fairly normal voice back. In summary, hemorrhagic polyps come in all shapes and sizes. They usually have a history of an acute vocal overuse, a cough, yell, scream, loud usage, although a chronic overuser can also get them. When we look, they're usually asymmetric. There may be a reactive swelling on the opposite side, and there are often visible dilated blood vessels, one, blood vessels that have been broken before, healed, healed larger, and they often go to the hemorrhagic polyp. The issue with all of the polyps is that they stick out. The person can't close the vocal cord all the way. They leak air. The second issue is it's asymmetric in terms of mass. One is heavier than the other, so we have the double pitch. <laughs> in my mind, the primary fix is surgery, seal off the blood vessels, take off the polyp, and then if the person needs management of their vocal behavior, it can be managed with appropriate voice therapy after the surgery. I'm Dr. James Thomas. Thank you for listening.